Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Patrick Gapgrau. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. I'll start with a couple of uh, housekeeping items just to remind everyone that there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them in the question box in the Go Webinar control panel. So you can add them in during the presentation at any point and we'll get to your questions at the end. And just also to indicate that the presentation is available in the hand, in the handout box in the Go Webinar platform. So I'll introduce myself and uh, tell you a bit about myself to start with. So my name again, I said is Patrick Abgrell, and I'm part of the WSP Canada Marine Team based out of Victoria, British Columbia. And I started uh, my expertise is especially related to marine mammal and impacts of development of marine mammals. I started my graduate work on marine mammals. Uh, I did um, some acoustic monitoring of Waddell seals in Antarctica. So I lived in Mawson Station, an Australian Antarctic station for a year for my master's work, and then continued on to large mammal habitat preference work uh, for my PhD. And that was out of Memorial University in Newfoundland in Canada. And I was involved in various uh, marine mammal visual and aerial surveys um, during my time. So it was a natural transition to move to environmental consulting. I started uh, consulting out of St. John's, Newfoundland, and did much of the work related to oil and gas exploration um, in Atlantic Canada. So seismic surveys, uh, drilling, what would be permitting, offshore monitoring. Uh, I was involved in a lot of vessel-based surveys, aerial surveys, <clears throat> and in time sort of moved to more Canadian Arctic uh, climate for monitoring and permitting. Uh, I was involved in a lot of work in the Canadian Beaufort Sea, uh, and then also some work in the later on into Eastern Canada in Nunavut, and sort of this will be a case study we'll be talking about a bit more today of the impact of some shipping operations in uh, Nunavut and in, uh, close to the uh, Baffin Bay. I'm also involved in permitting and monitoring in uh, Greenland waters, especially Western Greenland waters. So that was the picture here at the bottom during a site survey uh, in Baffin Bay, offshore Greenland. In recent years, I've been mainly involved in uh, community engagement as it relates to uh, impact assessments and sharing monitoring results, uh, talking to community members, elders, hunters, and seeing how our recorded monitoring results matches with what hunters and community members are seeing out in the water and uh, around their communities. And a lot of this work has been done in relation to the Baffinland Iron Mine Project, which is the case study we'll be talking about today. So I'll do a little introduction on the project. Uh, I'll talk about the importance of marine mammals to the Inuit communities um, around the project area, talk about marine mammal monitoring in the Arctic in general, and the impact that climate change can be having on our ability to effectively monitor and tease out project-related effects, and then close up with a bit of a adaptive monitoring that we've been implementing for the project. <clears throat> so the project is a iron ore mine operation on Baffin Island in Nunavut, Canada, and it's operated by Baffin Island Iron Mines. It's called the Mario River Project. And the area here you can see on the map here, this is Canada <clears throat> on top, the United States, Mexico, Alaska on the western side, and Greenland um, on the eastern side. And so Baffin Island is this large island right here. You can see it's pretty much the same length as the width of the United States. So it's a very big island. And it's just off the other side from uh, Greenland, separated by Baffin Bay. And specifically, the project is in the northern portion of Baffin Island, as you can see here if we blow in the section. And uh, this area here is Eclipse Sound. And the mining project, Mary River, is around this area here at the southern part of the map. And there's about 140 kilometer tote road that brings the iron ore. Um, that is mined to the shipping location at Milnport here. And then that is taken out through Milne Inlet 
into Eclipse Sound and out into Baffin Bay. <clears throat> uh, the nearest community is Pond Inlet here, so you can see it's right along the shipping route of vessels passing through Eclipse Sound. Uh, on top here is Violet Island, just to give some context. And what we find is that there's a lot of narwhal that use the area as a summering habitat. Uh, they're especially concentrated in this area here, which is Trombley Sound, which is not directly in the shipping route, just adjacent to the shipping route. And they're also found in Southern Mill Inlet in this area here, and especially in Kaluktu Bay in this area, just off the shipping line. So through our participation in the project, WSP has been involved in various marine mammal effects monitoring, uh, impact assessment, stakeholder engagements. Uh, we've been expert witnesses in public hearings as part of the regulatory process, process. So we've been involved in pretty much all environmental assessments of the marine uh, component. And um, I'll be speaking specifically uh, to some of the marine mammal monitoring that we've been doing as part of the project. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the project um, goes through a narwhal summering habitat. Uh, there, the vessel uh, traffic comes through, passes around uh, Pond Inlet, which is a community of about 1,800 um, um, people that live in Pond Inlet, the majority being uh, Inuit uh, community members. And there's concerns about what the project might be having to the narwhal population that use it in the summering habitat because it's a population that's used for local subsistence hunting from the uh, community members. So there's concern to some extent earlier on the project about vessel and ship strikes, less so now. And the main concern is with regards to vessel noise and how that might affect the ability of hunters to harvest uh, narwhal. So the concern is both their ability to harvest narwhal and the risk of population decline uh, as it related to the project. <clears throat> so as we can see here, this is from 2013 when iron ore shipping first started for the project. And you can see the population survey is done in the orange uh, line and the error margin around the population survey, population estimates, and the blue uh, vertical histogram lines are the number of return voyages related to the project. So you can see that it peaks just under 120 in some years and mainly around 80 vessel voyages. <clears throat> so looking through this, you'd see that increase in return voyages and ore carriers passing through the projects. And we see a decline in the number of narwhal abundance estimates through our aerial survey estimates. So the initial um, concern is that the project is directly having an impact on narwhal abundance to the project. However, if we look into adding in some historical data onto the project, what we see is that 10 years prior to the start of the project, the previous estimate was about 20,000 narwhal, as opposed to 10,000 narwhal in 2013. So what we might be looking at is a potential already existing decline of the population in the Eclipse Sound area, and it might not be related to the project in itself, it might just be a you know, pre-existing change in condition, whether it's related to climate change, whether it's related to the change in habitat suitability, and whether that's related to climate change or not. Um, you know, ice receding going further up north, maybe some of the populations are moving themselves further up north. Community members are seeing more killer whales in the project area, which is maybe driving narwhal to other areas where there are maybe fewer killer whales and more secure water. So it adds an element and a challenge to our ability to monitor the project related effects because there's a number of um, external factors that are hard to quantify that play in the equation. So our marine mammal monitoring program for the project is quite extensive. Uh, it involves visual and photographic aerial surveys to estimate narwhal abundance. It includes shore-based visual and drone narwhal monitoring. There's vessel-based monitoring, so visual surveys to ensure no vessel strikes, passive acoustic monitoring of narwhal, uh, satellite tagging program to track narwhal through the area. And there's also concerns of what the project might be having on seals, and the most prominent seal present in the area is a ring seal. 
So we do photographic aerial surveys to ensure that seal densities in the area are comparable to pre-shipping effects because seals are another one of the uh, primary harvested species by the local community. Uh, when we look at aerial surveys, so we surveyed, this is the area we were looking at in the map earlier here. So this is Eclipse Sound, Milne Inlet, and here's the port where the vessels leave and follow the ship track line out. Uh, Navy Board Inlet here on the western side of Pilot Island. And you can see that we fly these survey lines, the yellow lines, uh, with visual surveys. And in areas that I mentioned earlier were higher concentration areas, Trombley Sound, southern area of Milne Inlet and Kalaktu Bay. We fly uh, photographic surveys where we cover the entire area, take a high definition photo photographs of the entire area, and then we manually count the narwhal to get an actual accurate count of the narwhal, of narwhal in the area. And then we apply correction factors to account for animals that are below the water. So this is the area here and the stock that's considered the eclipse stock that uh, the Pond Inlet community here uses and hunts. And what we found is through the years that when we were looking at the population decline through the area here, the population estimate decline, we started wondering, we know there's an exchange um, through some satellite tagging and through talking to uh, hunters that some animals move between this area here, which is Admiralty Inlet. And there's a community uh, around this area here, Arctic Bay, that also hunt narwhal. And we know that there's an exchange of narwhal between the two. And so we decided to monitor both areas to see if there was maybe a movement of narwhal out of the Eclipse Sound into the Admiralty Inlet population. And what we found is through the years that when this population abundance was declining, the Admiralty Inlet population was increasing by uh, approximately the same amount. So overall, the amount of um, the population between the two stocks seems to be remaining stable. Uh, just like the point in our monitoring, that uh, we have sort of aero survey double blind observers. So we have both biologists and Inuit researchers that are part of the team. And uh, that's uh, pretty much for all our monitoring program. It's about 50% WSP biologists and 50% Inuit researchers that we've hired through the community, trained and try to build some capacity building in that area. We also do uh, visual surveys through a Bruce Head. So this is a shore based observation area. So we, in this area here, this is Milne Inlet again, Kalukhtu Bay, as we're saying, and the port is just to the south here. We have a camp established in this area here where we can monitor and visually monitor the entire area here and count narwhal uh, through the area, assess how many narwhal are present when ships are passing, when they're not passing, uh, how long does it take for narwhal relative abundance to, you know, sh shift back after a vessel passage. So this is the camp that we have here, we have a CCAN, modified CCAN that's used as a makeshift observation station that helps um, observers be protected from the elements a bit. And we also use a drone-based program to follow individual narwhals or narwhal groups and see what the direct behavior of those individual groups are when vessels pass, as opposed to when they're not passing through. So we're able to track narwhal and map out their movement uh, and therefore more sort of precise individual reactions to vessel as opposed to aerial surveys that give us really population level surveying and monitoring. We have ship-based monitoring where we have observers on the bridge of vessels. Uh, the main objective to that is to ensure that there's no vessel strikes on marine mammals as a result of the project. So we put observers on the vessels to ensure that the predictions that they would not be vessel strikes are indeed accurate. And the observers also collect data on the behavior of the animals, the number of animals or distance to the vessels. So that's all being uh, kept track of and compared also to the other monitoring programs. We do passive acoustic monitoring through our partners, JASCO Applied Sciences. Um, and we drop acoustic recorders in various uh, strategic locations as discussed by the communities where uh, there might be concerns of uh, impacts of the project on specific either regions or neural populations or certain areas that might be uh, believed to be louder. So we can track the ship noise and compare that to the acoustic predictions that were made as part of the impact assessment and ensure that our predictions were accurate and the noise vessel 
propagation, the sound propagation is within the predicted uh, limits. And this also allows us to predict the duration of potential impact to the animals from the project. So that knowing how long they might be uh, acoustically able to hear the vessels passing through and when it may or may not be a disturbance. We've also uh, been able to collaborate with Fisheries, Fisheries and Oceans Canada and be involved in satellite tagging of, in, of uh, individual narwhals. So these are net captured narwhals in which satellite tax, tags are um, put on the narwhal themselves. This is, a, said, like I said, a collaboration with the federal regulators here in Canada, Fisheries and Oceans, and as well with the community members. And through this, we can then track individual narwhal uh, through the project area where they're going through and if ships are passing, what their exact reaction is in the presence of ships. If they're leaving the area, so if there's a concern that the project is causing animals to abandon the area, we can track them through uh, satellite tagging as well. And we have an example here of uh, what this is. So these three animals and these three uh, different colors, blue, red, and yellow are tagged narwhal. And we'll see, uh, again, this is, for instance, where the Bruce Head camp would be. And the port is a bit further south here. This is Kalaktu Bay, which I, like I mentioned is a high and important area for the narwhal. And the vessels pass through here. So you'll see a vessel coming from the north, one coming from the south. And we can see what the movement of the narwhal is when the vessels pass. So I'll start the video now. So you can see coming from the north and from the south, the animals move out of the shipping lane here. And then when the vessels have passed and have left the area, what we can see is the narwhals then reoccupy the shipping lane that was there before. So we're not seeing a total abandonment of the area for the narwhal. What we're seeing is what was predicted as part of the impact assessment is that there would be temporary, temporal localized, temporally localized disturbance of the animals through ship passages. So what this means is that when a vessel passes, the animals will leave the immediate area around the vessels up to a couple, couple of kilometers, and they then have the capacity to reoccupy the area, so they're not leaving the area completely. So this is, you know, when you put all the monitoring programs together between looking at population level effects from the aerial surveys to individual surveys here, whether it be through the Bruce program, the drone program, or the satellite tagging program, we are able to put the whole picture together that what we're seeing is most likely not an abandonment of the area due to the project, but maybe a shifting in habitat due to other levels. So that's where it gets a little tricky in terms of figuring out you know, what proportion of the impact might be related to the project, um, if there's anything that's changing over time, and if the environment is changing over time where potentially the predictions have shifted. As I mentioned, we also do uh, surveys for ring seals. So it's strictly photographic surveys. So we both have infrared cameras and um, regular DSLR cameras, and we're able to spot uh, heat signatures of seals on the ice. So we run this survey in the spring when pups are born and seals are on the ice. So through the infrared camera, we can identify uh, heat signatures on the ice, and then we double check it through the regular camera to ensure that the heat signature is indeed seals. And through that, we can look at density of seals through the area and comparing to pre-shipping um, operations. And what we found so far is the densities uh, pre and post shipping or during shipping remain uh, fairly stable. So there doesn't appear to be any direct impacts of the project on the ring seal population. Um, so just closing up here and talk about adaptive monitoring and how sort of climate change, um, being able to include the Inuit perspective of the hunters that are on the land and how that's modified our ability to monitor and effectively monitor the population. So we've mentioned, we looked at various levels of the impact. We looked at population levels and individual levels to get the entire picture and be able to uh, fully assess what's going on. Um, and just in terms of, in general terms, like the amount of monitoring that's being done as part of this project um, it is a lot larger than what's typically done for a mining and a shipping operation project. So 
Uh, we've looked at so many levels of the project. Uh, we've expanded the aerial survey program to neighboring waters in Emeraldy Inlet. So when we saw a decline in the population in the Clip Sound, we wondered why this might be, because this was against the predictions of the environmental impact assessment. So we started monitoring Arctic Bay because we know that there is some exchange, like I said, through talking to the hunters, through some previous satellite tagging. And what we found is the overall population between the two remains stable. And then so you look at your you know, whether the project itself might be causing animals to go to a different location. And that's where the satellite tagging and the individual animal tracking through drone projects kicks in. And it doesn't seem that the animals that we monitor are leaving the project area directly to go to another area. So this kind of uh, helps us solidify the predictions and the impact assessment and better understand uh, the project related effects as opposed to uh, what might be happening normally and through just global climate change in general. Uh, we engage with federal regulators. So as mentioned, we collaborate with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And just this year in 2023, they did a full Arctic uh, narwhal population survey. So to assess whether or not, um, as well from other populations that doesn't have this project related impact to them, whether or not there's some shift in narwhal abundance from one region to another. And finally, a number of mitigation measures are applied to the project. Uh, these change uh, over time, but they're also part of um, adaptive management that we use as we get more information. There is a speed restriction to nine knots in the entire studied area, and that pretty much ensures that there is unlikely to be ship strikes to marine mammals. And it also reduces the noise uh, propagation area from ships going at a slower speed. Uh, there's various vessel traffic uh, transit restrictions to certain areas, whether it's in ice conditions or different areas where the project and vessels should not be going, uh, specific anchorage area to reduce the impact of the project on different areas. So on that note, I will leave um, it open for questions. Marine team in Victoria, uh, for those, you know, we have a little team, Zisu, uh, look to us and uh, everyone on this team has contributed to this project in various levels, whether it be the analysis, the field recording. So a great thank you to everyone in our team. And then I guess we'll uh, leave it to open for questions at this point. Thank you, Patrick. Fantastic presentation. And I love the photo. <laughs> it's just from yesterday, I think you mentioned. Yeah, we're having a group. Uh, workshop today we're doing different training for people who are new to the program to yeah learn different aspects of our the boats that we use and trailering and stuff and so we had our uh, different presentation and I gave this presentation to the group yesterday so that's it. yeah this is our group <laughs> as it is today yeah <laughs> perfect Thank you. So just mentioning the housekeeping items before we move to the Q&A session. So the presentation slides are available to download in the handout box on the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And you can also continue to log your questions in the question box. Again, this is, can be found on the control panel. I will start with the first question. Are all these programs that you mentioned run every year or do they alternate? Um, it, it depends on what the results are from a program from year to year. So uh, typically, we do aerial surveys, for instance, every couple of years because they're quite costly to run with uh, chartering aircrafts. But in recent years, when we've seen this decline in number of narwhal through the area, they've been done, uh, I'd say, four to four years in a row now to track the population and see if it's rebounding. And we saw uh, through the map there that it went down to 2,500 at one point, and it seemed to have been rebounding to about 5,000 last year. So we're currently analyzing the results from the survey we've done this year. Um, a lot of the other projects, like the Bruce Head Shore Base project, has been going every year since 2013, since shipping started. Uh, the satellite tagging is obviously more involved, and um, there's more disturbance to the to a few animals to provide us with that uh, with the data. So that project ran for two years in collaborations with Fisheries and Oceans. Um, there was obviously a slight disturbance in some of the monitoring as you know, when COVID hit uh, the area because uh, we wanted to ensure that a lot of the Inuit communities weren't affected by the risk of COVID coming into the communities, uh, simply because the medical facilities aren't uh, what they are in some of the communities in case there's an outbreak going through. So there was, um, you know, some slight impacts to the monitoring program, but for the most part, a lot of them have been 
going on for multiple years in a row. And uh, yeah, it's been able to provide us with an amazing data set to test the impact assessment predictions and track the narwhal population and, and individual reactions to vessels. Thank you. How many, how many narwhals do we have uh, in Canada? So I guess we'll get an updated population estimate based on the survey they've done this year. But uh, from the 2013 survey, we're looking at about 140,000 narwhal. So when we're looking at Eclipse Sound that has um, approximately 10,000 narwhal uh, in any given year in between Admiralty Inlet and Eclipse Sound, it might be in the 70,000 uh, number of 50 to 70,000. There's a, there's a wide range of variation, right? When you're looking at aerial surveys because we have to account for animals that are in the water and use correction factors. And these correction factors are based on often tagging data to assess how much time the animals spent underwater. So we can assess maybe how many animals we're missing through um, our visual surveys. Uh, so yeah, so out of 140,000 narwhal in the Canadian Arctic as a whole, about 10,000 of those are in the Eclipse Sound stock that we're looking at. Thank you. Can you share with us if the local community, the Inuit, are in favor of this uh, Mary River project? <clears throat> yeah, so it um, there is sort of mixed feelings on the project in some extent. Uh, communities are very close to the impact, have obviously more concerns. Um, some of the hunters are indicating that they've seen uh, some of their you know hunting success been impacted. Uh, again, and that's where we're trying to figure out how much of this is maybe related to the project or how much of this is related to maybe there being fewer narwhal in the area and whether or not that's related to the project or just things like global climate change, um, shift in ice patterns. Um, a lot of the narwhal in the area are related to ice conditions at the start of the shipping season. So if the entrance to Eclipse Sound is blocked by ice, which was a case that happened this year, a lot of narwhal might just continue on their route and go further up north to other areas and other summer areas. So it's a very, uh, the environment shifts through to many conditions. So it's hard to impact and to assess the impact on various levels. But the project also brings a lot of economic benefits to the community. It's a huge uh, employer in Nunavut and it provides a lot of social programs and economic downfalls to the community. So there are a number of people that are in support of the project. Uh, and I think as in general, the communities just want to make sure that the project doesn't uh, prevent them from uh, being able to continue traditional activities and traditional harvesting activities. Thank you. The next question is, uh, when estimating abundance and density, how do you avoid double counting? <clears throat> yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so we have... Um, we, we've been able to most years do the survey with two planes. <clears throat> so the entire area in Eclipse Sound, we're able to cover that entire grid in one day. So for us, that sort of reduces the risk of double counting animals because if you're doing the survey in multiple days, obviously these are you know, marine mammals, whales, and they move through the water. So if you start in an area and you cover half the area in one day, by the time you get to the next day, it's possible that animals have um, come through the area. So our main goal is to try to cover the area in a short amount of time as possible to avoid animals moving through the survey area. And we can do that if we use two planes at once. And um, we also try to cover the area between Eclipse Sound and Admiralty Inlet in back-to-back -back days to also reduce the movement of animals from the Admiralty Inlet stock and the Eclipse Sound stock to see, as we know, there's exchange and quite a bit of exchange between the two. Thank you. I will take the last question. You mentioned several monitoring methods. Do you use these monitoring methods elsewhere? Uh, yep. So depending on the project, we'll run aerial surveys for other projects, um, especially vessel-based monitoring is very common for oil and gas exploration and for um, seismic surveys. For instance, we'd often have observers on the seismic vessels. Uh, it's very rare that we use these many number of monitoring programs all combined together in the project. So this, this sort of case study that I'm presenting here of the project is an example of sort of um, a huge number of monitoring programs just because of the sensitivity of the area, um, the amount of information that was available to start with and to ensure that we accurately uh, are able to 
quantify as, as accurately as possible the impact that there might be on the neural population and individuals to be able to tease away impacts and project-related impacts from external impacts on a project, like I mentioned, such as potential global climate change and other environmental aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you all for your questions. All questions that were unanswered will be answered directly by the presenters. You can see uh, the contact details for Patrick uh, on the screen now. Feel free to contact him for any additional questions. And that's it. Uh, we're wrapping up the session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Patrick, for the early uh, call today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.